Hello and welcome everyone. Today's webinar is about the new normal and what it means to the pet industry. We will talk about consumer trends, business implications, and some strategic thought starters as well. My name is Nidofer Absal, and I will be joined by my friend and colleague, Ken, co-hosting this webinar with me. Hey everybody, we're glad that you could participate. Uh, I will be back on and presenting a little bit more in the back half, but uh, we will let Nilu kick off everything and get this going. Thank you, Ken. And before we dive into the actual presentation, everyone, a couple of housekeeping points. You will receive the presentation, but do take notes because at the end of the session, we will have time for questions. And uh, as we go through the presentation, if a question pops up, type it at the bottom of your screen. You see a Q&A section. Use that box to send us the question. We'll pick them up at the end of the session and try to address as many as we can at the end of the session. So let's start by doing a quick poll. So based on the factors that we are all aware of and the current conditions that you are aware of, when do you think we will enter the new normal? The new normal could mean different things to different people. It could mean when the work from home has been lifted, when public events are started, it could mean many different factors, variables. But as a group, let's do a quick poll to see which one of these options, you see four options on your screen here, A, B, C, and D, which one resonates with you? A, which is the light green, you feel that the new normal will be between June to September 2020. With the yellow, the B, too many variables, you can't be certain, so you want to pick that. If you feel that the new normal will probably be October 2020 to March 2021, then that's the one you will want to pick. And last is the D, which is anytime after April 2021. So I'm putting up the poll here now. So do pick which one you think makes sense, and then we will share the polls with everyone and the results with everyone. Okay, I think we got about 90% of the votes in and it's a close tie. Let me share the results with you. It's a close tie of October 2020 to March 2021. 47% of us think that's when the new normal will start and 33% of us feel unsure. There are too many variables for us to guess the timing and some of us are really optimistic and we are hoping for that light green june to september hey i'm with you there as well i've had enough of the lockdown but let's all enter this period with caution so those were some very quick insights that i wanted to share with you and uh taking it from there actually taking a step back let's take a look at the curve of any typical crisis. There are five stages to any crisis. It starts with denial, you know, where the predominant sentiment is around shock. You're not sure what's happening. And then we move into anxiety. Anxiety is where our predominant thought was, how do we protect ourselves and our loved ones? And we were stockpiling on toilet paper. Hey, even pet food went through a stock up and pantry loading spike. And as one week rolled into another and yet another, we started to adjust. This was that adjustment phase for us. We were getting quickly used to this new lifestyle of working from home, having the kids around, learning from home. This brought about a bit of anxiety around expenses and the planning for the long haul was something that we all started thinking about. But now, as some regions are starting to see a flattening of the curve, there is talk of reopening. And this is the reevaluation phase. And we are more conscious now of the habits that have kind of become ingrained into our lifestyle. And we're starting to you know, look out into the future and trying to figure out 
what will that new normal look like? And that's the reason I wanted to have this gray circle on the right side of the chart here, because there are a number of unknowns that we're not aware of and know how the future will shape up. But one thing is definitely for sure, the future and the new normal will not be the same as the normal of the recent years. Even as recent as November and December last year, the New Year's Eve that we celebrated, you know, all of the crowds that we were hanging out with, that's not going to be the same in at least the short term. So to truly help you prepare for the new normal, today we will be touching on three key areas. Survival, restarting, and thriving in the new normal. This will be underpinned by evaluation and preparation because that's the key. We really want to understand and evaluate the consumer and market trends. We want to get prepared in terms of what these mean to our businesses. What are the implications of these changes that we're going to be facing? So let's take a quick look at survival. And this is again at a 20,000 foot level that we'll be touching on the strategies here. Uh, when you think about survival, especially in times of black swan events, it is centered around rapid change and transformation has to happen. That is the key. Pivoting is the key. Things that you had probably put off for two years out or even a year out have had to become priorities for today. But keeping that outward facing lens and keeping tomorrow in mind. The next uh, key thing to keep in mind is having an open mindset as you're solving for problems and looking for opportunities keeping an open mindset and being willing and open to innovate and try new things trying new ways of doing business will be important to survive through this managing cash flow and limiting supply chain risk this is another very important area because we i think most of us in this group here are from the product centric industries and exposure to supply chain risks will be something that we will have to be very conscious of. The next one, which actually is uh, going to be seen throughout this presentation is around staying closely connected with our customers and vendors. That sense of transparency that we have been trying to adopt in the past few years actually becomes much more urgent now. People understand we are in the same boat, you know, if you have out of stock issues, if you're having some challenges internally, talking to your vendor partners, talking to your customers and being transparent is the way to go. Last but most important is remember to be human because we are all going through this crisis and our communication, be it with our employees, our vendors or our customers, has to have that element of humanity. And I'll touch on this later and actually it'll come up a couple of times in the presentation because this is a theme that you will see come back across multiple touch points. Brands, businesses that are showcasing authenticity, ethical behavior, giving back to the community are the ones that consumers and shoppers will be gravitating towards. So we'll touch on this a couple more times through the rest of this presentation. But the neat thing about this crisis, uh, or rather the silver lining, is the fact that it's bringing out the best in humanity. And uh, there's been a surge in solidarity through this period. We are more uh, grateful, we are more authentic, we are more uh, connected with each other. So that said, let's take a deeper look at the consumer trends that we're seeing. What are the shifts that we have been noticing for the past few weeks? So we've gone through a, a recent recession, 2008, 2009. So some of you may be familiar with some of the consumer shifts that we will see here. But the thing to keep in mind is whenever we go through some sort of major black swan event, like I mentioned earlier, shifts tend to become permanent habits rather than just temporary shifts in behavior. So that is something we want to be cognizant of as we start doing a deep dive into some of these uh, insights that we're seeing. And the reason I say that is because this black swan event has been even more impactful. The speed and scope of the impact has touched every single aspect of our life, be it physical, financial, mental, or social. We have been touched in some shape or form. And 
the fact is that a lot of inconvenient truths have been brought to light. The cracks in our healthcare system, the way we've been caring for our seniors, a lot will change in the very short term. I'm hoping for the better coming out of this. So when we think about the shifts that we are noticing, I wanted to start off by grouping them into six big categories. And we will go into each of these in more detail. We will look at the data points. We will look at the business implications coming out of each of the uh, uh, consumer behavior shifts that we're noticing. So let's start with the first one, which is around health and hygiene. Early on in the crisis, in the very first few weeks, we noticed that household cleaning products and supplies saw a huge surge in sales. In fact, pet care also saw an upward swing of about 28% in March. Uh, and we'll talk about the uh, changes that have happened further down when we go into the details of the pet category. That has changed because in some of these categories, it was all around sanitary loading, but consumption hadn't changed. And in some cases, consumption went up. So there are variables. As you're thinking about demand planning, keep those various uh, types of demand, arch types that have come to light in mind, and then build your strategies around it. And the other thing I want to touch on here is pre-COVID, health and well-being was actually an emerging purchase motivator. But moving forward in the new normal, this will become table stakes. This will be important for every single purchase decision and it will influence us in how we make purchase decisions and change our behaviors in the future. So the next one I want to talk about is around unemployment. We just got some recent numbers from uh, uh, both US and Canada, and the numbers are pretty dismal. Canada, as of May 8th, actually last Friday, when the numbers were released, our unemployment rate reached 13%. In the US, it's close to 15%. These are double-digit numbers that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. And as a result, we are seeing a redefinition of spending habits. Uh, the predictions from analysts are that close to about 40 to 50 percent of discretionary spending will be reduced. Uh, when consumers were asked if they had been financially impacted, 24 percent said yes they have in some shape or form and 34 percent, actually sorry, 32 percent said that yes they anticipate being impacted in the near future. When people were asked, when do they anticipate returning their spending back to normal? About over 40% of the people felt that it would take at least six months or more for spending to go back to the pre-COVID era spending levels. So numbers that we should all be aware of and be consciously thinking about as we're building strategies to deliver the results that we are looking for in the new normal. Another uh, very interesting uh, consumer insight that we were able to pick on is that the perfect storm came together for the DIY revolution. You know, people were in the lockdown, they were looking to save, and lo and behold, we saw searches on Google go up significantly for DIY solutions. Hey, you know what? 43% of pet parents said they will continue grooming their pets at home even in the post-COVID era. A lot of parents, 32% actually, have been practicing on their kids' hair during the lockdown. You know, all the hair salons are closed. So they've been, I think, uh, they've been having enough practice for them to feel confident they can continue uh, cutting their kids' hair even after uh, we come out of this crisis. I think most of us have gone out and bought some sort of workout equipment for our homes. Gyms have been closed for past quite a few weeks now. So 67% of people have said that they will continue working out at home rather than rejoin a gym. So I know these are very initial reads on consumer trends, but even if they are up and down a few percentage points, they give us a directional sense of, you know, what the future would look like. And the other one that I want to quickly talk to you about is around physical distancing. It is going to take the shape of a multifaceted uh, uh, 
consumer uh, behavior. Uh, things that you were seeing uh, sporadically, uh, things like you know delivery robots in public places will become more mainstream. Curbside pickup, home deliveries will become more important from an omni-channel strategy perspective. Protecting our older generations will also be very critical. We can foresee new rules, new layouts for these institutions in the near future. Working from home will definitely be a new normal. A lot of organizations that I've been talking to and reading about have seen the cost savings and the benefits of this new way of working, this new structure for the teams. And uh, uh, this might become more of the norm rather than the anomaly. So something to keep a watch for as well, because this will also then drive the kind of things that people are going to be purchasing. And uh, the, thing, the trend that I'm really happy to see actually coming out of this crisis is the need for connection, the need for empathy. Unfortunately, in the past few years, we had become a bit of a empathy deficit type of a society. And this new normal is making people realize that those are the things that are important to them. So brands that are showing authenticity and empathy during these difficult times will be the ones that consumers will be gravitating towards. We will see a need uh, for uh, you know, a lot more of these digital platforms uh, coming to life. Hey, I've had a lot of Zoom parties in the past little while. And uh, from our industry's perspective, the pet industry's perspective, Another thing that we can uh, feel happy about is that this need for connection and empathy is actually driving up a lot of pet adoption. In fact, a number of shelters are completely empty, both here in, the U uh, in Canada and the US as well. So uh, this is something that I feel quite happy to see, uh, and I'm sure uh, you feel the same as well. And tying to this trend and something that we noticed uh, pretty, uh, uh, strongly in the last recession was around nesting. Nesting is all uh, about, you know, staying at home, cooking more at home, spending quality time with your family and your pets, having more of those game nights with your kids. And this is actually kindling the sense of slow living. People are rethinking and relearning their priorities and appreciating the concept of slow living. So, you know, for a lot of people, uh, being busy had become synonymous with success. It was almost like this badge that we would have, that we would wear proudly and say, oh my God, I don't have time for anything else. I'm so busy. So that will more likely change. And that you've seen a lot of these TikTok videos. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the uh, father and son's TikTok dances. Amazing, amazing uh, things that have come about that we wouldn't have seen in, uh, pre-crisis period. So this is the last trend from a consumer shift perspective that I wanted to touch on. And these are the six trends that we feel pretty confident will continue on into uh, the new normal and for the longer haul as well. So continuing on, we want to now try to take a deeper look at what these consumer insights actually mean from a business implication perspective. As businesses are starting to think about how they reopen, how they start engaging with uh, their customers and consumers, a lot of these shifts and habits that we looked at will become reality very quickly. So I want to start off with what we touched on a couple of times earlier around ethical behavior. Ethical drivers will be three times, uh, will, will actually mean that if you're showcasing these ethical uh, drivers, consumers will be more likely, three times more likely to actually uh, connect with your brand and purchase from your business or your brand. So if you're showcasing integrity, purpose, and dependability, these will become the key motivators for loyalty and perhaps even switching in the near uh, future, actually right now, because what we're seeing is a rise in switching. 30 to 40% of consumers between March 23rd and March 29th was when the survey was done uh, in the US. This was the sentiment survey that was done by McKinsey. We found that people, 30 to 40% of consumers have tried new brands and 50% did this because of availability issues. 
because they could not find their product or their brand in the store that they were visiting, or there was an out of stock issue online or wherever they were purchasing from. And another 20% shift, shift switched because of uh, price. So price is also going to be playing a big factor uh, in the decision-making journey. I wouldn't actually call this bad news or a threat, actually. This is an opportunity for those of us that are willing to work with the data and try to optimize our uh, offerings, try to optimize what we're doing during these trying times because 12% of the consumers that have actually tried a new brand or a new product say they will continue with this in the post-crisis and the new normal period that we will be entering. So this is something that we want to try to tap into. Uh, if there are shoppers that you know you can entice over to your brand that are on the cusp of uh, switching, let's put those plans in place. This is the right time to gain market share, to grow your overall share of the pie. So let's try to utilize these data points to make those meaningful changes uh, in uh, the strategies that you're putting together during your restart phase. And of course, e-commerce was already trending huge, uh, uh, was showing uh, double digit growth. But the spike that we saw now was uh, unanticipated. This was a huge acceleration uh, around e-commerce. But another area that I want to highlight here, other than what we already know, is around digital marketing efforts. The consumer decision journey has suddenly become much more complex. And there are so many more digital touch points now that they are getting um, engaged with that there is a need, the expectation from our consumers and our shoppers is that they want to see a seamless presence, a seamless storyline, a seamless uh, tone and message across all touch points, be it online or offline. So the three key takeaways that I want to also touch on from an e-commerce perspective here are number one, there is a need to deepen your relationships with your e-commerce partners, your current partners, because these are going to be partnerships that will continue and become much more aggressive in the new normal. Uh, secondly, you want to develop and invest in your own e-commerce platforms as well. It could just be a marketplace on an existing uh, uh, e-commerce platform, but do try to have your own brand presence and your own brand pages as well on these platforms. Because the way, if you're able to capture and mine your data, your shopper and consumer data, you will be able to then optimize your marketing investment. The return on marketing investment will be much more, uh, much more optimized when you have the data to work with and cut and dice in different ways. So that is another key area that I wanted to touch on very quickly. But the thing is that, yes, e-commerce is very important. However, when we looked at this research that was done recently, as uh, recent as last month, uh, what we found is that 60% of people were still going into the stores. So yes, e-commerce has grown significantly, but in-person shopping is still very important. 14% of the people that were part of the survey said that they were exclusively shopping online. 26% said they were shopping equally online and in-store. So what does this mean from a channel mix perspective? Of course, e-commerce, we've talked about this multiple times, is very important. But the other new channel that is really coming to the limelight and seeing a revival is the convenience channel. The mom and pop stores have seen a revival. You know, the convenience of just going in and out without having to wait in long lineups that go around the block sometimes is what's driving a lot of people to travel uh, to these smaller stores. So this could be, again, a trend that you want to be aware of, especially if you're a business and a brand that is trying to expand your channel mix and be in the right places. These are things that you want to keep in mind as you're developing the strategies moving forward. And a lot of these uh, insights that we were seeing are actually already coming to light. Uh, when you look at uh, the nesting trend as an example, within the fastest growing categories that we're seeing, home appliances has grown exponentially. People are buying floor by the 
10 kg bag loads and are actually baking bread from scratch at home. So that whole nesting uh, at home that we talked about, cooking at home that we talked about, is already coming to life. You know, we have been home for a long time. Hey, I need to color my own hair. So yeah, hair color uh, sales have gone through the roof. So you see all of these uh, trends already coming to life in terms of the actual sales spikes in these categories. And then on the flip side, those categories that are driven by external factors and external motivators are seeing a dip. So we're not going to be traveling anywhere anytime soon. So of course, luggage and suitcases are seeing a dip. Our disposable incomes are being guarded very closely. So we don't want to spurge on probably a thousand dollar cell phone. So these are the categories, very top line level, where we are seeing significant drop in sales versus the pre-COVID period. We have a number of retailers and uh, distributors that have registered uh, for the webinar. So welcome and thank you for joining us. So wanted to make sure that you got some good insights from uh, the point of view of do's and don'ts as well. So what are those do's and don'ts that as a retailer you have to keep in mind to win during this COVID period and also after the COVID-19 crisis has passed? Well, the first one that I want to touch on is enforcing physical distancing will be very important, even in the foreseeable future. Uh, industrial level cleaning and making sure that there's very deep sanitization happening is going to be the cost of doing business. Ensuring products are in stock will be important. You don't want shoppers to leave your store and uh, gravitate to another channel or another retailer because they couldn't find what they're looking for at your stores. And having staggered shopping hours, being aware of those uh, vulnerable groups, especially with seniors, some retailers have already done this and have dedicated hours for those groups of people to come in and shop might be something that you would be considering. Uh, protecting your, your employees, uh, having enough sanitizing stations, PPEs for your uh, teams to feel protected will be important. I know a number of retailers out here in Canada and the US have already implemented these uh, strategies. They've put up plexiglass shields at checkout counters for protection and they're doing a number of things uh, for their employees, uh, which is amazing. And of course, you know, having those alternate channels of fulfillment will also be important. At the bottom of the screen of this slide, actually, you'll see uh, a spectrum of retailers that was picked up by Cantar US, uh, the research house that did this uh, research. And we see the ones that are not really there towards the right, all of those ones that are doing a phenomenal job at this point in time. This is just a snapshot of some of the retailers in the US. But you get the gist, you get a sense of, you know, what those uh, uh, stakes are going to be and what the key areas of focus will be moving forward. Another trend uh, that I wanted to talk to you about uh, is around uh, the importance of local, especially for those businesses and grants that are being produced locally, be it uh, in the same country that you're selling in or uh, uh, even the uh, same province or state or city. Being local is coming out as a big trend, is coming out as a, a business implication that we want to be very cognizant of moving forward. It could be a little uh, sign that you put on your packaging or the messaging that you have on your social platforms, but calling out the local or made in, um, say, Toronto or made in uh, Chicago uh, for the US will be important to enhance your product's value proposition. As you can see, the categories here are centered around uh, uh, immediate use type of uh, human food and beverages. But based on everything that we know of the humanization trends within the pet category, we can easily extrapolate that this trend will bleed over into pet food and treats as well, for sure. So that said, uh, another mindset that we should be very aware of, especially as people are looking for savings and convenience, is uh, how you are uh, uh, interacting in terms of uh, shipping timing uh, and timelines. So when you think, when we asked, uh, when the Bazaar Voice did this research recently, 
39% of consumers said that they prefer or have used the two-day shipping. In fact, if you're able to provide same-day delivery, even better. 31% said they use the buy online and pick up in store option. 30% have tried the subscription service. This is especially useful when you know the cadence of your purchase and your consumption. So um, going back a few years, actually, when I was working on uh, uh, the Amazon business uh, a few years ago and ended up with another company, cat food had actually become very successful. In fact, Amazon US felt that that was their case study that they would use across uh, 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 different categories for the subscription model. Given the timing that you normally uh, have for your regular purchases for cat food, the weight uh, and uh, you know the format of cat food, it became a huge success for uh, the subscription model. So just something that I wanted to highlight uh, in, uh, in terms of subscription services. If you can bring this into your portfolio as a retailer, this will be something uh, good that you can uh, offer and enhance the value of your business proposition. 96% consumers said they are now very consciously checking prices before making the purchase decision. Hey, but wait a minute. 52% said that they are willing to pay more for a brand that they like. And when I say like, I'm putting that in quotes because of all the other trends that we saw earlier. If they perceive a business as being ethical, they are three times more likely to prefer that brand or that business or that retailer than, uh, than another one where they feel that they are not delivering on those uh, uh, areas and motivators that are driving them to purchase. So time, uh, convenience and cost will be very critical moving forward as well. So regardless of the size and scope of a business, having a strong digital presence is a must in today's uh, uh, environment because consumers are expecting it. Consumers are engaged, they are connected, and they are everywhere. Especially now, uh, this uh, data research that you're seeing on the slides was actually done last month between April 1st to April 23rd by Bazaar Voice, and it was comparing the same time period last year. And what was uh, seen here is 54% increase in the number of reviews in April 2020 versus last year. 32% increase in questions that were being asked of the brands. And if you're a brand, if you're a retailer, and one of your consumers or one of your audiences is actually reaching out to you and asking a question, the expectation is that the reply they, that you would be replying to them within 24 hours or less. Anything past 24 hours takes you into the red zone. And also replying to you know things like reviews, be it a positive review or a negative review, will take your business a very long way, showing that you care. Managing the digital consumer journey, honestly, is another whole topic in itself. So I won't go down this rabbit hole just yet. Perhaps we can connect on this topic uh, at a later date. But continuing on, you know, prior to this webinar, we were uh, uh, asking the participants if there were any specific questions or topics that uh, you wanted us to cover. And uh, we got a few questions. People wanted to understand the shifts in media habits that we're noticing uh, due to this crisis. So I've added a couple of slides on this. I won't go too much into the details and we'll talk only to the key takeaways of all of these data points you're seeing here. People have been home. We have all been consuming a lot of media lately. However, what we have been noticing also based on the analysis is the marketing ROI is lower. You're consuming a lot, but there's no need probably for that much uh, ad spend to be put out during this time. So 65% of marketers have indicated that they will be reducing their ad spend. And another interesting thing that I wanted to call out here is the media mix. Live news and TV have actually seen a revival as a result of this crisis. People have gone back to that quote unquote, perceived an authentic source of information rather than relying on say your Twitter news feed or your WhatsApp group of classmates from school or university to uh, tell you what's happening in the world. So that's the shift we're saying. 
So the key takeaway here is if you're making any media decisions, make sure you base them on the right data sets that you have available. And it's not just about, you know, where you're communicating, but also what you're saying and what the message is, how the brands have been adopting to these uh, different uh, periods of the crisis that we talked about earlier, the different stages, is very interesting. You'll see a lot of different words uh, being used uh, as we go through the various stages of the crisis. And a number of brands within our uh, industry are doing a phenomenal job. I've only picked a couple here on the slide to showcase some of the points that we've been talking about. So pet stores, we know the grooming sections have been closed for the past uh, few weeks now. And uh, you haven't had customers walk through your doors with their, with your pet, with their pets to uh, get a, a grooming done. So some uh, retailers, and here's uh, Ren's example actually, have started posting on the social space tips and tricks on grooming pets at home. Yes, there is data that's saying that perhaps a number of uh, your consumers and customers will not come back to the store and do it themselves in the uh, new normal as well. But hey, since you know that, you might actually start seeding ideas and start differentiating in terms of why you should be that destination for pet parents to bring their pets for a grooming session. So on this note, actually, without going too much into any more details from a pet perspective, I will hand it over to Ken to walk you through the implications and what it means in more detail to the pet industry. Ken, over to you. Thanks, Neil. Um, that's some fantastic information. But now the role is going to be to make that connection and application to the pet industry. And as we know, there are uh, many pet professionals uh, online now, all from different parts of the industry, be it media, retail, distributors, and sales groups. Our goal now, and my hope, is that I'll be able to tie a lot of this information together as we start to plan the future. Well, in order to get an idea of where we're going, we need to know what has happened and look back at the most recent recession and the impacts on the, on the pet market. So again, as we think of 2008 to 2010, in the US, we saw a, a two-year decline in pet and a significant drop off in pet purchasing to the point of a minus 12 in, in 2010, but a relatively quick recovery and growth back into the plus four, plus five. So a pretty dynamic change and it was pretty abrupt. In the Canadian marketplace, we saw softness. We did not see the dramatic decline that was there, but we have seen that softness. And so our plan and thoughts are around how does this relay into the future? One of the other current trends that we have seen is that mirroring of, of con human consumption trends. So as Nilo had pointed out early, we talked about the pantry loading where there was the rush on toilet paper or hand sanitizer. Ken, please call Ron. Ken, please call Ron. And we now look at uh, additional opportunities to say, how do we grow? And we look at what happened with pet food, which was at plus 52 over the first three weeks of the, uh, of the, the current situation, but then it's dropped off for the month of April. We have seen significant as consumers have loaded up their pantries they're shopping a lot less on for their product. As we also discussed around the lockdown, the pet care services is down 63% because consumers cannot go into those stores to do that. So we know that the product service or the pet services section is going to take the largest hit and it'll take some time for that to come through. We also know that the human animal emotional bond is a tremendous part of, of the entire pet relationship. 99% of the people see their pet as family, right? If you think back to the way it used to be, the dogs were outside, they were just kind of property. Now they are part of the family. 77 or 76% said that they would spend almost anything to keep their pets healthy. And 51% of them actually share their bed with their dog. So again, it's important to realize that this is such an important part of our business and it's part of what makes it so special. We've seen some significant shifts in the consumer profiles over the last five years. The millennial and Gen Z are now accounting for 45% of the population versus 26% only five years ago. And this group has the highest buying power. 
So even though they may not be the dominant uh, demographic yet, their buying power is an area that we as a business, regardless of where you are, need to focus on. And they are willing to spend their money on the products that they believe in and want to shop in places where they're currently looking. So again, it's extremely important for us to think of everything that Neelu talked about and the places our people are shopping. How do we make sure that we're communicating in the right area? As was previously discussed around the growing trends in e-commerce, well, specific to pet, we have seen a massive shift in pet, where you know, in 2015, 7% of pur purchases were done on all internet. So that could be anything from Amazon, Chewy, to any retailer's commerce platforms. They're now saying 26 or 22% is where it's at now with the plan to grow even higher. And who's winning? Those top five, Amazon, Chewy, PetSmart, Walmart, Petco, they all have massive structures in place, specifically on the US side as to where that's gonna go. On the Canadian side, we're seeing Ren and PetSmart uh, and a lot of our independent retailers also working hard on their e-commerce platforms. It is going to be critical to have an omni-channel strategy for brands to make sure their content is complete, that your retailers have e-commerce capability, and that you're communicating via the channels that consumers are currently using. As mentioned earlier about social bond and empathy, that trend for internet searches on pet and animals is climbing. Adoptions and fostering animals are up. And we believe this is gonna have a lasting impact on the market as more pets in the household means more consumers and more consumption. We do hope that we're not going to see a reverse and you know, once things return, that people will start abandoning animals. That's always a risk, but we do believe that what's happening now as, as evidenced by that slow down mentality that this is going to be a longstanding uh, growth trend for the industry. Many previous existing trends will be maintained. We go back and look at what's happened at the various shows, the PJAC shows, Super Zoo, a Global Pet, things that we have seen over the past few years as we've related to the DCM issues and grain-free, there's also grain-friendly. We're looking at whole animal nutrition, recipes based on allergies, lickables, desserts, rotational feeding, human grade, revival of canned wet. These trends that were started before will continue through the innovation that's going to be brought forward into the pipeline and as retailers distributors and salespeople, it's our, be our goal to find those solutions moving forward subscription services and neil had mentioned that and subscription services make it easier for people to order the regular items it becomes the kind of they don't think about it it replenishes every month they get their order but it's also a trial and sampling program such as BarkBox, which allows consumers who aren't able to go out and shop in the impulse categories get new items delivered to them that they test they try and hopefully they'll be able to find an e-commerce platform or a way for them to purchase those products in the short term and then ultimately back into the stores as soon as the stay-at-home orders are lifted so again this is a great opportunity technology is another aspect of disruption we have wearable technology we have people using their uh, phone and apps for telemedicine to get tips and tricks around health concerns around their animals and We've also seen the same issue around uh, medicine and treatment. So again, people are concerned about how they're taking care of their animals uh, throughout their entire life stage. And so technology is going to be a key part of that as well. Other areas around future disruptions. Again, technology isn't just driven by electronics, but there will be elements that are technology driven products, cameras, remote opening doors, interactive toys that drive off of electricity, but also around uh, new ideas and ways to work with products. So probiotics into cat litter, uh, insects in sustainable ingredients in food and treats, plant-based. We think again of what's gone on with the Beyond Meat Burger for human consumption. There is a moving uh, area of people looking for how do I feed the veg products to my animals because if they believe if they're vegan, they want to put some of those same adaptive lifestyles onto their animals. We also look at sustainable packaging, eco-friendly transportation, and maybe for condo dwellers that package portable grass patches so that they have a little area for their animal to relieve themselves out on the porch when they can't take them to a park. You'll even see in the raw area, um, a company, uh, Yay Doggy uh, Fresh Food out of the U.S. has partnered with Instapot 
And so they're taking an existing current trend on home appliances and they're finding ways to actually deliver prepared meals that you can use your Instant Pot and now create a, a menu of sorts for your furry friend. So disruption can come in any form in any possible uh, avenue. So now we look at the next phase. What's it gonna take to thrive? Well, in all honesty, it's gonna be about innovation and investing. Uh, we go back and look at 2008 to 2010, that time frame. some of those companies that won, some of those companies that were very profitable turned around and invested in R&D. They weren't cutting R&D budgets, they were looking at ways to drive growth through the recession. They accelerated profitability because they focused on the white space, those new opportunities. Many of the companies also went and invested in areas outside of their core competencies. They looked at what other industries or other businesses were doing to find ways to expand their scope and their scale to allow them to win. And how do we do this? It really revolves around a mind shift. It's that mind shift of playing defense and moving to offense. So it's about looking at those risks. You have to understand, yes, you do need to do what you can to mitigate your risks. You need to be concerned about health and safety, operational efficiencies, as well as your P&L. But it's a matter of looking and deciding when is the right time to pivot, when is the right time to turn around and take something we do well and put the hammer down and go aggressively after it. You think back to the SARS outbreak. During the SARS outbreak, again, you had same stay-at-home orders in various places around the world. And what happened was Alibaba took advantage of the fact that e-commerce was just starting. They uh, accelerated their plans and they become a $470 billion behemoth just based off of that. And even most recently, a cosmetic company in China, which was forced to close 40% of their stores due to COVID-19, they redeployed beauty advisors, put them into a digital landscape, gave them those tools, they engaged with the customers, where the customers were, and they drove sales. So it's a matter of realizing that no, and we're all dealing with the same situation regardless of whether we're a retailer, a distributor, a salesperson, or a brand. How can we pivot and how can we leverage what we do well to grow? The key here now becomes, what are these steps? So our business strategies have to adapt. Supply chain optimization is going to be a major focus. And from supply chain, it can be everything from looking at ways to get the product out to the consumer faster, leveraging your distributor network, or leveraging direct to consumer, leveraging uh, your uh, curbside pickup, uh, even to the point as a brand of looking at saying is how do we make sure now that we're minimizing maybe the distance and the time and operational efficiencies around sourcing our ingredients local, sourcing our packaging local so that we don't have to worry about longer lead times, those elements that maybe will cost us a bit more in the short term, but the efficiencies and effectiveness will allow us to be successful long term. Three, be where the shopper is. Omnichannel takes on a whole new meaning and a whole new urgency while we're now having to deal with this normal and understanding that the consumers want information, they want product, we have to speak to them where they're asking their questions and answer as quick as possible. Four, optimize your offerings and innovate. So again, when the consumer demand is there, what do we need to do? So some areas of pet care may see a slowdown in contraction, long-term, short-term, but what can we do to pivot? What can we do to grow and take advantage of the fact that pet ownership is increasing? And so there is a huge opportunity. It all comes down to agility. It comes down to swiftness. In all honesty, Rapid change means those that can adapt will thrive. And those that can't or won't, won't be relevant for long. Look at the number of retailers recently in the news that have announced that they've had to file for bankruptcy. We know that there's gonna be some impact up and down the road with some of the smaller organizations, some of, some of the small stops, maybe even some brands, because they just don't have the bandwidth or they don't have the financial means to, to make those changes. But we need to look at what can we do? How can we react? and how can we plan even better. And with that, I'd like to thank you guys. Uh, we will open it up to, so, to Q&A. Um, we do have a little bit of time left on the Q&A side, so we will uh, leave those questions open for you, and uh, we'll go from there. So Nilo, if there's any questions that you want to start answering and, and field, we'll go from there.
Okay, the uh, first question that I see on my screen here is uh, a question around e-commerce. So given that e-commerce will go up significantly, uh, it would be a challenge to break through the clutter in the digital media. Do we foresee any innovation in the digital media space? And if you can address this. I do think that there will be some, and it's going to be uh, kind of dependent on I guess who who the specific audience is. So yes, there are going to be, and there are agencies and there are firms that specialize in digital media that are looking at trying to uh, react as quick as possible to the, the the new reality of where things are going. So um, we do believe that uh, that there will be a a change. And and yes, you're right. There is going to be an awful lot of clutter. And there will be a lot of people who do it well. And there will be a lot of people who don't do it well, and they'll just flood the the uh, the market and, and you know kind of the channels with a ton of information that is not as relevant. And I'm sure you've seen it. You may have seen some examples of stuff that's come across your Twitter feed or Instagram feed, and you're just like, ooh, maybe not the right messaging they want to be sending right now. Um, you know, it it is important, and I think the brands need to look to you know kind of go back as Neil had mentioned to think of their authenticity. What is it we stand for? And how do we want to communicate and, and, and approach the, the humanity uh, of, of that connection first? Okay, uh, another question, Ken, that I think you might want to take as well. This is around uh, pet treats and what we foresee will be the changes around pet treats that are more impulse purchases and sometimes considered an indulgence rather than a must have for the pet. So based on the trends that we're seeing, how do we foresee treats evolving in the new normal? I think the treat market is still going to be a huge growth opportunity um, because there are treats that will provide those functional benefits. And so when we're looking at uh, elements of, of a feeding regime and you know kind of keeping your caloric content to about 10 percent um you think it would be a, 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 gr a great opportunity to continue that uh, the other aspect becomes around the impulse nature and, and the hard part around the impulse nature is if uh, the stay at home orders stay longer then you have a lot less opportunity for the uh, that impulse purchase that kind of catching them at the cash register that 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 last minute uh, you know i've got some history working in the confectionery business and you kind of look at that that you know the last few feet before you make that purchase is is that area where you want to hit them with to, to get that last uh incremental purchase um, so that's going to be a challenge and i think from an e-commerce standpoint the uh the treat brands are going to have to do a better job of of finding ways to make sure that uh that their information is there that they're they're relevant and that maybe they work with the retail partners, et cetera, to say, hey, when somebody's going through the checkout, how do we make sure that maybe there's a, a treat of the month option or something about, hey, have you thought about this? You kind of kind of almost brings back the McDonald's, uh, would you like fries with that uh, opportunity to upsell? Um, because when there's not a human directly in front of you, uh, it does make it different. I do believe that functional treats are gonna continue to grow. Natural treats are gonna continue to grow there's going to be an awful lot of opportunity for that to, to continue further. Awesome. That's a great answer, Ken. Uh, we have one more question that just popped up in uh, the chat feed here. Cat litter. How has the market changed on cat litter? And um, any thoughts that you can share around this category? I don't have as much information on cat litter. Um, but I do know that there are significant changes from a, a variety of different options that we're looking at and are going on from a sustainability of the product itself. Um, obviously, the odor absorbency and the elements that can be done with that. Uh, one of the challenges you always get with cat litter is, uh, is the weight, the shipping, and things of that nature, trying to make it as effective and efficient as possible. So... It, uh, you know, there, there is a lot going on. There is a, a lot of movement around it. I mean, obviously the lighter weight you can make it, the, the less it costs to ship and the more you can make it effective and efficient. Um, but there is innovation that is continually going on, looking at using compostable materials, recyclable materials, 
uh, end of life. So if, I mean, even when we were talking previously, you know, if, if other organizations will look at uh, maybe some waste material from the, the fruit production, how can they leverage that uh, walnut shells or something of that nature to become an absorbent material. So there is a lot of innovation going on in the marketplace. Uh, we can continue to dig deeper to, to help you look for, for more of that. Absolutely. And just going back to a few slides earlier where Ken was mentioning some of those uh, newer disruptive trends that we are noticing, uh, cat litter actually made it into two different types of uh, innovation uh, criteria there. One was around the automatic cat litter cleaning uh, uh, equipment and the other was probiotic infused cat litter, you know, things that can help reduce the pain points of uh, your pet parents, you know, reduce the odor, reduce uh, uh, the amount of time it takes to clean the cat litter and uh, keep it fresh and clean. Those are areas that you will continue to see a focus on. So any innovation, if you're able to address a consumer pain point is what you want to be focusing on moving forward. And we'll take one last question that we have here from Lynn. Do you anticipate any issues with some of the treats being provided by other countries? If so, what will uh, uh, you guys be doing uh, in, in this regard? So with regards to, um, I, I think answering that question specifically, um, yes, there are concerns from importing in other countries, and that was part of the the piece there around supply chain. We, you know, organizations need to look at um, at different countries. Uh, you know, not only protein source of origin, um, but uh, you know, making sure that there are no concerns or or outbreaks from from those host countries. There are always going to be issues and concerns um, as you start to look at longer lead times to import things, as they've got to get, uh, you know. On a boat across uh, across an ocean, um, so there there are always going to be concerns. I think uh, there will be some fallout. Um, I do think that you know we we had seen in the industry already was that there was a move away from products sourced from places like China. Uh, there were concerns around that, um, even though the uh, various countries have you know started to present uh, you know data and supporting information to say that there there's okay there is a consumer perception and in the consumer's mind that that perception is a reality um, so there are always going to be uh, those those aspects of, of concern um, so I think any brand uh, needs to do what it can to minimize its risks to its supply chain um, and that's something that uh, that we are always looking at so Yes, there are concerns and we will be addressing everything we can to try to look at sourcing more local um, and making sure that we've got everything we can to, to protect the products that, uh, that get brought in, not only for our business, but for our consumers and, and obviously the end consumer, which is our, our, wonderful, uh, our wonderful dog. So. Awesome. So we only have, I think, three minutes left uh, for the end of our session. So. We do have a lot more questions that have been coming in, but given that we are running uh, short of time, we will definitely do a follow up. So with that said, I want to hand this, uh, have a few closing slides here with Ken. Perfect, thank you. Um, as Neela mentioned, we will get back to uh, many of you on your questions or comments specifically there, but you know, what we wanted to do was uh, hope that you got some useful information um, out of this and that, uh, if you're not sure on how you can make some changes, how you can pivot and, uh, and really take advantage uh, of, this, uh, of this opportunity, because that's what it is, it is an opportunity. Um, we at, uh, at G2G um, would love to help you build your roadmap. Uh, we focus on three key areas of, of business operations, so strategic planning, where we can help you with restart plans or multi-year strategic plans. Um, we can work towards helping you with your innovation planning, your, with a, be it end-to-end -end consulting or any type of tools and coaching around the process of innovation and making sure that what comes out is both predictable and profitable. Um, and working with you on, on people. So engagement is high performance. How can we help you with a high performance culture in your organization? Uh, looking at uh, the multiplier effect across multiple uh, cross-functional teams, um, those are areas for us that we would love to work with you. 
So if you have any questions or are interested in knowing more about what, uh, what can be made available uh, on the next slide, our contact information is there. Uh, so you can reach out to Nilu or myself. We would love to set some time up with you to make sure that, uh, that we can continue to answer your questions. We will send a copy of this deck out to you so we will be able to follow up with you individually. And if you have additional questions, um, feel free to fire those off to us. And uh, I'm at this point going to pass it back to Nilu uh, for the final wrap up. Thank you very much, Ken. This was a lot of fun for us to put together. And I really hope you found value in the information that we have shared. And uh, the session uh, was uh, recorded as well. So we will get a copy of the presentation as uh, Ken mentioned. But do drop us an email. You have our contact information and we will definitely set up some follow up sessions with you. If you ha have more information that you're looking for on certain areas, we'll be very happy to help with answering any of those uh, for you as well. So once again, thank you for joining us. It has been a pleasure having you here and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.